Bristow by Frank Dickens, with Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Bewes as Jones, Owen Brenman as Hewitt, Dora Bryan as Mrs. Purdy, and featuring Liz Fraser and Joan Sims as Gert and Daisy. Of Moles and Men. I am a very private man and because of this, respect the privacy of others. In modern times, the invasion of another's privacy is accepted as the norm, and due to this, those well off enough must take stringent measures to ensure that those in their domestic employ do not go around spilling the beans or blowing the gaff, as it is called in the underworld. I was reminded of this the other day, when I ran into Curtin Daisy, two members of the Chester Paddock cleaning staff enjoying a well-earned tea break. Anyway, so I said to her, Lady Chester Perry, I said, my mother, God rest her, who worked for Lady Spicer before the war, always wore gloves for the protection of her hands. It's the first thing a gentleman notices about a member of the opposite sex, her hands. Her hands, yes. I mean, it doesn't matter what the rest of her is like. It's the hands that attract the men. Hands, yes, like a peacock's feathers, the hands. Peacock's feathers? Feathers? What are you talking about? The feathers to attract the female. It was on the telly. No, you're talking body language with peacocks. I'm talking texture, not body language. The beauty of the hands, not waving about. The beauty, them. yes. Well, I lady, just a she, penny, yes. She didn't like me speaking my mind like that because mm. you see, you can't see the beauty of her fingers for diamond rings. Good morning, lady, sir. Oh. I hope I'm not intruding on your private conversation. Oh, no. But I heard mention of Lady Chester Perry. <laughs> do you know her? Oh, mm-hmm. of course we do. We clean for her. Uh... You clean Sir Reginald's stately home, Dunwell Manor. Oh, it's not called Dunwell Manor, except by the people that work here. <laughs> it's called the Grange. The Grange, yes. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. What's it like? Oh, we're, we're not allowed to discuss not it. Allowed. We have to sign a paper, don't we, Dave? Yes, to keep it secret. Oh, I see. A, a sort of official secret act. Our lips are sealed. Mm, my lips are yours, aren't You're always talking about it. Oh. Morning, Mr. Uh, yeah. Morning, 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 Mr. Yeah, Jones. Morning, Jones. Did you know these two clean for the chest of Perry's? Dunwell Manor? Hmm. Oh, it's not called that, really. It's called the Grange. No, I didn't. So you see our beloved firm's founder in the privacy of his own home. That's right. Do you speak to him? Of course we do. Every day? Yeah. <laughs> do you talk to him about what goes on here? Of course we do. <laughs> but our lips are sealed, aren't they, Dave? Yeah, they have to sign an official secrets thing. Well, yeah. you should have refused. They're public figures. They're oh. for public domain. At my uh, further education class last uh. night, we were discussing the royal family and their rights to privacy. That's the nice thing about going to further education classes, discussing items of general interest. Further education? What, what, what are you talking about? Uh, didn't I tell you? Well, I'm attending further education classes every evening. That's the first I've heard of it. I didn't mention it because I know you take no interest in the future, like most of Sir Reginald's employees, and I didn't think you were interested in bettering yourself. Thank you, Jones, for those incisive comments on the lack of enthusiasm on the part of your fellow workers to better themselves. Yeah. But the oh, subject I was discussing with these ladies was the intrusion into the private lives by the modern generation. And as I was saying, if you were paying attention, and this is another failing of those who have no desire to better themselves, that That's people it. in the public eye, and I include Sir Reginald and Lady Chester Perry in that class, are public property, and like the royals, we have a right to know what they do in private. Yeah, well, with the greatest respect, might I say that you are talking through your further development oh, well. hat when you say that our beloved firm's founder and his even more beloved wife... A public property. Well, they well, are, they are public. famous, Mr. Bristow. That's mm. the price of fame. Yes. That's why we have to sign that paper, isn't it, Dave? What piece of paper is that, George? Well, you know, the piece of paper that said we wouldn't go around talking about things. That 
piece of paper we signed. I signed it. I don't know whether you signed it. You were talking non-stop. Oh. You get carried away at times. Uh, Proper uh, motor mouth you uh, someday. Uh, steady, oh. ladies. Morning, ladies. Oh, oh morning, morning Hewitt. Hewitt. Um, Hewitt, you represent the younger generation, so your teeny, teeny, tiny views must be worth something. Do you think Sir Reginald and Lady Chester Perry are public figures, and if so, are in the public domain? Uh, well, you mean like Beckham and Posh Spice? Oh. Yeah, I knew it was silly of us to ask him. Uh, Bristow, don't dismiss him like that. He's making a valid point. Yes. Whoever it was he's talking about are obviously in the public eye, mm. and that is what we're discussing at the moment. Hewitt. I was at my further education classes last night right. discussing well-known people and whether they are in public domain. Well, I should think Beckham and Posh Spice are. They're in everything going. Now, personally, mm. I think they are wrong for each other. Mm. Dave should have stuck to the ball. I yes. told you it was silly to get him Just involved. a minute, Bristol. Just a minute. Hewitt is answering the question. He has an opinion. And this is because Beckham and... Uh, Posh Spice, Spice. Hmm? are high-profile figures, and naturally of public interest. What is going oh on? Oh, sorry. Haven't you people got anything to do? Yes, yes, of course. You cleaners, kindly get about your business and stop distracting my staff! Oh! Oh! Well, what a misery! Yeah. He's not allowed to talk to us like that, is he? Yeah, you know, oh, well, we don't mind. Well. He likes to let off some steam every now and then. Puts him in a good mood. For about five seconds. Well, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't have it either, Gert. I'm going to tell Sir Reginald. Well, you better let me talk to him. I'm better at it than you. Mm. Goodbye, gentlemen. Oh, goodbye. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for the... <laughs> Little did I realise, as the door closed behind them, that a door had opened to the unmentionable and unspeakable Jones, who had, without anyone suspecting, already begun to make use of those two hard-working cleaning ladies, and was already infiltrating Dunwell Manor through the tradesman's entrance. It was not until the next day that I realised that Gert and Daisy were to be taken seriously. They were enjoying another well-earned tea break when the fudge entered. Oh, oh. Bristol. Good morning, ladies. Only Mr. Fudge. Congratulations, ladies. <laughs> the first time I've ever heard him deliver a grovelling apology. <laughs> time he was taught some manners. <laughs> now, where was our days? He was putting Sir Reginald in his place. Oh, that's right. So I said to him, I said, Sir Reginald, I said, with respect, you are wrong. Mm -hmm. Your staff are not mindless worker bees simply toiling to acquire the remuneration that is their honey. They are hard-working and thinking people eager to develop their minds, oh. like Mr. Jones of the buying department, oh. who attends further education classes for that very purpose. What purpose is that, Dr? To develop his mind. Oh. That's why he goes to classes. Oh, I wish you'd pay attention. Oh, sorry. Jones of buying, he said in that lardy da voice of his, <laughs> and must make a note of that name. People with ambition are few and Far between and worth uh, keeping an eye on. <laughs> <laughs> I suddenly realised the evil that is Jones. He had cottoned on during yesterday's conversation with Gert and Daisy that they were of use, and his mention of attending further education classes had been deliberately planted to ensure that Sir Reginald Chester Perry, our beloved firm's founder, would get to hear about him. A vacancy had occurred for an assistant head of production control, and, like mine, his hat was in the ring. I decided to tackle him at the very earliest opportunity. It came during an enforced rest in the gruelling Chester Perry work schedule. Oh. 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 Jones, mm. oh. would you mind if I ask you a personal question? <clears throat> that depends on how personal it is. Is it normal personal, medium personal, or smack in the mouth personal? Normal. Fire away. What would you say if I told you, with all respect, you are the slimiest, double-crossingest, double-dealingest, 
sycophanticist, evilest, schemingest, unsavouriest, backstabbing blackguard I have ever met. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. I know what you're trying to say, Bristow, but you don't have the vocabulary to put it across. <laughs> I suggest evening classes on basic English will help. If you really want to express your feelings properly... Don't give me that nonsense you were trying on the cleaning ladies earlier. Me? That mention of further education classes was expressly aimed at planting the image of yourself as an ambitious would-be executive, no, knowing never. they would mention it to Sir Reginald. You've uh, never uh, been to a further education class in your life, you charlatan! You are only annoyed because you didn't think of it first. No, 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 as they probably say at further education classes. Smothering a curse, I took some extra work into the typing pool. I hate suffering alone. Good afternoon, Miss Simon. An angel dressed in a woman's fun. Oh, <laughs> are you putting on a little weight? Or is it a trick of the light? It might be weight, but it doesn't matter. I started aerobic classes last week. The weight will soon come off. Yeah. Oh, aerobic classes, eh? Yeah. Very trendy. I'll say. Sir Reginald Chester Perry's daughter, Fiona, is in my class. Wow. Do you speak to her? Of course. She's easy to talk to. It, do you mention work? Well, if it crops up, yes. Yeah, I thought it would. I was talking to someone in my advanced further education classes about that kind of thing last night. You go to advanced further education classes? Mm. I had no idea. You've uh, never uh, mentioned that before. Yeah, it's not the kind of thing you talk about. You just do it if you're ambitious. Mm. You have to these days to keep up with the pace of modern business, especially if you want to get on. That that's what Mr. Hewitt says. He was in here just now. <laughs> Apparently, he attends junior further education classes for the very same reason. <laughs> oh, he's a funny lad. He calls them junior further education classes, but they are just a bunch of teenage tearaways that meet on street corners and whistle at girls. <laughs> uh, it's funny the amount of time one wastes when one is young, and how one only realises it as one grows up. Uh, I used to laugh at further education, but now I can't get enough of the stuff. Let's get up that ladder. Oh, Mr. Brister, <laughs> although you act as an easy going, eager-to-please kind of guy, I think underneath you're as hard as nails. You are right, Miss <laughs> Sunman. They don't come any harder than me. And ruthless, too. Right on, Miss Sunman. They don't come any more ruthless than me. Hard as nails and ruthless, too. So, how come, if you are as hard as nails and ruthless, too, mm. you're only 18th in line for Chief Byer? Uh, yeah, well, underneath the hard as nails and ruthless facade... I'm an easygoing, eager to please kind of guy. Oh. <laughs> Sunman, hmm? there's a Fiona Chester Perry on the telephone in my office asking for you. Uh, would that be Sir Reginald's daughter? Yes. I'm so sorry, Miss Glockling. She doesn't know we're not allowed personal phone calls. Could you tell her to call back? Uh, no, that'll be all right. Uh, take it in my office. Oh, thank you, Miss Glockling. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Bristol. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, these modern youngsters. <laughs> Time was when top management and employees never made eye contact, never mind rang each other up. I don't really approve, I'm afraid. I'm one of the old school. Yeah. I don't go for these classes where staff and management meet socially, and I don't think attending them is a good career move. But judging by what is in front of me, you wouldn't know anything about good career moves. <laughs> possible for me to leave at 4.30 this afternoon. Fiona wants me to go shopping with her. Oh, of course you may go at 4.30. Be sure you tell her you have my permission. Thank you, Miss Glockling. <laughs> uh, um, I'm not so sure I agree with your decision, Miss Glockling. Just because Fiona is the only daughter of our beloved firm's founder, she carries no weight here. <laughs> but even as I speak, I realise I'm being stupid, because being the only daughter of the firm's founder gives her quite a lot of weight here. And I think you have made a good career move. Bye. <laughs> I 
decided to enrol in further education classes without further ado. Miss Glockling had been wrong to dismiss them so quickly. To my mind, they were an essential career move. Had not Sir Reginald, in his conversation with Gert and Daisy, noted Jones as a person to keep an eye on? And had not Miss Sunman, purely through a connection at her classes, been able to leave work early? <laughs> And it seems to me that if you can get time off by mentioning someone you meet at evening classes, then I'm all for evening classes, for getting time off is the best career move of them all. Ah, 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 good morning, Mrs. Purdy. Cup of your wet and warm, please. Strong enough so that when I drink it, I stagger round the office like a drunkard on uneven paving stones. I'll be like it that strong, do you? <laughs> well, stand well back. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way they like it at evening classes. Don't tell me you attend evening classes. I don't attend them. Well, I do, but only to do the refreshment. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, where do they hold these classes? Oh, all over the place. The majority of the people here go to St Mary's Mixed Infant School. Why are you asking? Are you thinking of going? As a matter of fact, I am. Oh, you should. Best thing to do these days. You can never get enough education. Uh -huh. I said that to my husband, but you can't tell him anything. I've got my education in the University of Life, he says. <laughs> Pig ignorant he is. I'm proud of it. And our eldest son, Elvis, takes after him. Mm. All he thinks about is football. Football mad he is. <laughs> Where's that going to get him? He works in a warehouse. <laughs> if it was good enough for Dad, it's good enough for me, he says. Mm. Oh, I married badly, Mr Bristow. I should have married Roger Gatsby, the jeweller. Ah. He promised to smother my hands and wrists in diamonds. He did. <laughs> have you finished with your towel? <coughs> yes, thank you. Oh, I was nice and strong. I can feel my desk swaying about like a boat on water. Oh, oh my eyes! <laughs> That's French, yeah. Hey, I think it's all systems go. I have the desire to acquire further education, and I know where it can be obtained. There is nothing to stop me. Morning, Mr. Bristow. Ah, Hewitt. I've decided to enrol for evening classes. Why don't you join me? Or perhaps you'd rather stick to your make-believe junior education lessons. Oh, you've been talking to Miss Sunman. Look, I, I only told her that because she goes to aerobic classes with Chester Perry's daughter, Fiona, and I thought Fiona might be interested in a young swinger who wants to further his career. <laughs> Patently absurd. But carry on. Well, I'm interested, yes, but... I don't know whether I'd like to attend the same classes as you. Mm. Well, I'm a much younger man and naturally prefer the company of people my own age. <sighs> I feel that by going to classes where there are loads of geriatrics... Adam, no offence, man. I'd be missing out on the dolly bird. Morning, Well, well, Mr. Further Education himself. <laughs> Come to impart more words of wisdom, have we? More stuff from the non-existent night classes. You don't have to actually attend evening classes to land the job of assistant head of production control. Mm. You have to let people believe you attend them. Get the word to the people who decide these things. It's common sense. Yes. What they call using the old grey matter. Well, you're saying you don't go to evening classes? No, 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 no. no. You said you did. In front of the cleaning ladies and I believed you. Oh, you were telling lies, weren't you? Uh, nah, 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 nah. Oh, very funny. <laughs> well, I'm disappointed in you, Mr. Jones. You modern generation. <laughs> We were like that once. And Jones, you may have been. I was never like that. I spent the first part of the afternoon smarting, and the rest polishing my halo. For was I not going off to try and better myself? After we finished work for the day, I hastened downstairs to the front desk to ask the whereabouts of the school Mrs. Purdy had mentioned earlier. St. Mary's Mixed Infants. Yes, that's right, Eddie. Well, well, well. I never thought the day would come when Mr. Bristow of the buying department would show an interest in further education. Yes. <laughs> you do well at evening classes. Oh, yes. I've heard you sleep all day, so you should be nice and fresh for the evening. Where will I find it? Uh, down the road. Past the bull and bucket, left at the crown and two chairmen, straight on past the anchor, and... Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wrong image. You're going to evening classes. Sorry. So, so 
uh, down to Dylan's the bookshop, <laughs> left at the library, straight on when you get to the university. Yeah, no, I'll find it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Mr. Bristol. <laughs> yes, madam. Funny how a sudden spring comes into my step when the Chester Perry building is behind me. <laughs> here, now, here we are, St Mary's Mixed Infant School. If you can read this, you are too old. <laughs> yeah, uh, please ring for attention. Hello? Captain Crook, holy mackerel, are you still in school? No, I live here with my mummy. You've pressed the wrong bell. I, I'm sorry. Yes? Is this the place for evening classes? Yes. I know that face. Aren't you Mr. Stokes, the concierge with Chester Perry's? I'm the caretaker, if that's what you mean. I know your face, too. You're Mr. Jones's friend. You're the chap that's always treading on my cat. Her pitiful cries are with me still. Yeah. A word of warning. they got a cat here, too. Well, I don't believe it. What's the matter with you? I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry. I didn't see it. Just hope nobody finds out. You ought to get your eyes... Never mind about my eyes. I said sorry. I'm trying to find out about evening classes. Oh, you come to the wrong person to find out about that. Mm -hmm. If it was to do with classrooms or the toilets, you'd be talking to the right man. If it was about the cloakrooms or toy cupboards, you'd find none more helpful. If it was about playgrounds and swings and roundabouts, go no further. But evening classes... That's my Achilles heel. What's going on out here? This chap's trod on the cat. He does it all the time. I didn't see it. He's got bad blood, that's what he's got. Bad blood. David... I'll take over. Your face is going bright red. You go and lie down. You work at Chester Perry's, don't you? Yes. I've seen you gazing out of the window on the second floor of the Chester Perry building. You've been doing it for years. No matter what time of the day it is. You're a landmark. What can we do for you? I'm interested in further education classes. Are you? I mean, are you? Uh, yes, I am. I'd like to enroll. I'd like to start tonight. I'm afraid that's not possible. Not possible? Why is that? We are nearing the end of term. Oh, that's all right. I can catch up. I learn quickly. I have a retentive memory, like a sponge. Dates, times, places, no problem. <laughs> you know, try me. Try and remember. Hmm. The new term starts on the 3rd of September... At 7.30. Uh, hang on, I'd better write that down. <laughs> Let me explain. You have to register at the beginning of term. You cannot join a class as and when you feel like it. There are rules. We cannot break the rules. I'm sorry, perhaps next term. Get the, I, I'm sorry, but that isn't good enough. How can I put it in a way you'll understand? Last year, Sir Reginald and Lady Chester Perry applied for advanced bridge tuition classes, and we were unable to accommodate them because the term had started. <sighs> like you, they were not pleased, and we even received a letter from their legal department querying our decision. Fortunately, we were able to produce the rules. <laughs> if Sir Reginald and Lady Chester Perry were refused, what chance... I understand. Thank you, and good night. The next day was bright, sunny and warm. Imagine my surprise when hovering around the cleaning ladies who were enjoying a well-earned tea break, I was surprised to hear the following. So I said to him, I said, Sir Reginald, what are you trying to say? Your staff can't spend too much time at night classes. You can't have too much study. Oh, you shouldn't have spoken like that, Gert. He that pays the piper calls the tune, remember? My father told me that. He that pays I the piper. I know about he that pays the piper. I wasn't born yesterday, but I was only speaking my mind days. You can't be hung for speaking your mind. You can these days, but go on. 
Tell me what happened. I quite agree, he replied in that posh way of ease. But I will not have people who work for me attending night school to study to the detriment of their work. He's right. He's paying the piper, isn't he? Of course he's right. And he's entitled to call the tune. He's had Mr Jones checked out. He has. Oh, he has. He told me, after our conversation the day before yesterday, he said, I asked for a report on Mr Jones and was surprised to find both it and him curiously negative on all cows. Negative? That means he's no good. Right on. He said... If he claims to attend evening classes, and I have my doubts about that, I can only assume he realises he has no future with us and is studying before applying for a position elsewhere, he said. Fancy. Uh, good morning, lady. Oh, don't we look smart this morning? Very smart, a credit. A credit to his mother and family. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I'd like to dress up sometime tonight. Is my fridge night. You oh, play bridge. Mm. Oh, isn't that funny? Tell him, Daisy. Sir Reginald likes bridge. He plays a lot of bridge. Oh, is that so? Mm. <laughs> well, I never. <laughs> well, <laughs> that is a surprise. Oh. <laughs> Good morning, Hewitt. Good morning. Cheer up the pair of you. It's not the end of the world. It might just as well be. Why? What's wrong? What's wrong? I'll tell you what's wrong. They brought in someone from outside as assistant head of production control over our heads. That's what's wrong. Don't be ridiculous. He's not being ridiculous, Mr Bristow. It's true. The tea lady's son, Uh, Elvis Purdy, has got the job. It's it's impossible. He lives for football. How can a chap who knows nothing except kicking a football around be promoted to assistant head of production control, our position above you, Mr Jones and myself, who've been here all these years? How is it possible? He plays football. So he plays football. He plays football in the same team as Robin Chester Perry, son of the firm's founder. Bristow was written by Frank Dickens and featured Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Bewes as Jones, Owen Brenman as Hewitt, Dora Bryan as Mrs. Purdy, Liz Fraser as Gert, Joan Sims as Daisy, Katie Odie as Miss Sunman, John Glover as Fudge and Eddie, David Batley as Stokes, Carol Starks as Miss Glockling, and Jane Booker as the teacher. The music was composed and performed by John Whitehall. The sound recording was by Graham Harper, the director, Neil Cargill. Bristow by Frank Dickens. With Michael Williams as Bristow. Rodney Muse as Jones, Dora Bryan as Mrs. Purdy, Owen Brenman as Hewitt, and featuring Leslie Phillips as Mr. Perkins. The good, the bad, and the temporary. As a child, I did not mix with other children. Not for me, the hustle and bustle of the school playground, with its attendant noise and clamour. For me, an unnaturally quiet and reserved boy, pallid of face and noted for my sad but luminous eyes, my pleasure at that time was reading Zane Grey novels. For Zane Grey wrote westerns. 
As I grew older, my pleasure in the written word was replaced by an obsession with the movies, and in particular those with Western themes. Cowboy films were the order of the day, where the main ingredients common to every movie of the genre was the arrival of the stranger in the shanty town and the inevitable showdown. I was reminded of this one day last week, seated at my desk in the buying department of the Chester Perry organization, when Mr. Perkins of personnel entered the room. Oh, good morning, Mr. Rester.、Uh, good morning, Mr. Perkins. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Fudge is not in.、Uh, good, because it's you I've really come to see. <laughs> Surely you flatter me.、Oh, not really. I have a request to ask. Fire away, Mr. Perkins. Fire away. No bless of bleach, etc., etc. Mr. Fudge has asked me to arrange with Tilly's Temps for a girl to help out for a fortnight. <laughs> I did not hear the end of whatever it was he said after this. That feeling of weariness came over me, the feeling that all aging gunfighters with a reputation experience, when they are informed a young stranger has come to town to try his luck, and I sank back in my chair. One day I knew there would come along a temp. I returned to normality to hear him still speaking. You have acquired a reputation, undeserved, I'm sure, but a reputation nevertheless, of being less than kind to girls sent from Tilly's temps. That you are less than civil, or downright rude, in fact.、Mm. Tyrannical is a word that is mentioned frequently in the letters of protest that start to arrive as soon as the girls report back. And、uh, no, 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 let, let me finish. That girls sent here, fresh-faced and full of joys. Return as battle-scarred war veterans, in order that we continue to do further business with Tillys. And there are rumours that our relationship with their company is iffy. I wonder whether you could,、um, you know what I mean,、mm. take it easy, treat them like human beings, especially this one. I think those remarks. Should best be directed at Mr. Fudge. Come off it, you! You and I know the girls never see Mr. Fudge. It's you that causes all the trouble. You're the one that makes them cry.、Mm -hmm. There's nothing to do, Mr. Fudge. Just take it easy. That's all I'm asking. Milk of human kindness stuff.、Hmm? <laughs> you know what I mean. Oh, oh, oh morning, Bristow. Morning, Mr. Perkins. Oh no. It's not temping time. Come round again. Don't say that.、Uh, good morning, Mr. Jones. I'm afraid it is. Nothing due to me. Accounts have requested I get in touch with Tilly's temp. Another crazy, mixed-up temp. Why? 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 Wake up! Calm yourself, Jones. Keep your feelings under control. This one may be different. She won't be different, and you know it. Temps are all the same. They tear your heart out of your body, and they wring it and twist it until they've squeezed every drop of emotion out, and nothing remains but a dried-up husk that was once a man. I say, steady on, old man. Oh God! Is he always、believe. like this? Temps are trouble, trouble, treacherous, forever teasing, tantalising. This is nothing. You should see him while we're waiting for the tea trolley. He starts getting、I'm, heavy. Look, I, 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 I've got to go. I've got to do. Why? I, I'll return the Why? time. Why? Now, what we need, Bristow, is、um, a plan where we don't have to speak to her. What we need, Jones, is to leave the word "we" out of things. I'm not getting involved with any of your schemes. Is that clear? Morning, Mr. Bristow. Morning, Mr. Jones. Lovely day. Is it? Is it a lovely day, or is it the dawning of a new age of deception and deceit, of heartbreak, of jealousy? Oh, don't tell me we're getting another. Oh, <laughs> why, how why did why you did know? I remember the、oh, way he behaved last time. Now look, Mr. Bristow. Wait, wait, just a second. I'm on the phone.、Oh. This morning everything seemed to be fine. Then this. Is that Joe's joke, Emporium? Yeah. Really, yeah, I'd like to order an electric handshake,、oh. a whoopee cushion, a clockwork mouse, a dangly spi, a dangly spider, half a dozen exploding firecrackers.、Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, 
They are sending another tempt today. Thank you. Jones, I think you and I should have a serious talk. Uh, j- just a minute, Mr. <clears throat> just a minute. I'm on the phone, on the phone. Ah, ha, ha. Hello? Uh, say it with flowers. I- I'd like to order a bunch of roses. Yes, yes, it's Mr. Jones of Chester Perry's. <laughs> yes, they're sending another one today. Chocolates. Mm. Why not? Why does Mr. Yes. Jones, knowing you will have his certainly. heart broken again, uh, perhaps, persist yes, in welcoming yes, the new tent with flowers and chocolates? Tempts are his weakness. As a child, he was starved of affection. Yes. And the first human being that ever showed him kindness was a temp mm. he met on a caravan site whilst on holiday at Stony Beach on Sea while he was in his teens. Yeah, well, I like temps. I like them because they're here today and gone tomorrow. There is no commitment. They come into your life and before you know it, they're off again. There's none of this serious stuff. Uh, uh, you keep it that way, my boy, and you'll never find yourself in trouble. Never mix business and pleasure. Otherwise, you'll end up like Jones. Uh, here he comes now to ask Rister. about his appearance. <coughs> yeah, Mr. Yeah. Is, is the shirt clean? I mean, really clean. It was clean when I put it on this morning, but you know, with all this pollution... It's clean, Jones. It's clean. And my tie? It's Okay. The double winds are not as slightly old fashioned, but. I mean, the colour. Does it go? Does it. Go? What do you think, Hewitt? Mm. I'd like it to look sporty. Mm. You know what I mean? Uh, well, a tie with breakfast all down the front can never look sporty. I didn't have any breakfast this morning. Coffee and marmalade. Yesterday morning! I should have had it clean! Uh. I knew I should have had it clean! Uh. What am I going to do? I haven't think! Sit down. I'm too nervous to sit down! Do you think we should tidy this place up a bit? I mean, look at, look at the window! Yeah, I can't oh, oh, take any more of this. Oh, have you seen that? That's the phone gun as well. I can't stay there. Oh, Anyone wants me? I'm in that typing pool! All right. Look, I'm glad. I'm glad he's gone. Yeah. It'll give me a chance to explain a little idea I've just had. Yeah. When the new temp arrives, we'll start talking about the uh, national economy, yeah. how it has killed any enthusiasm you had for working hard. Yeah. And you go on and on about it. Yeah. How there's no future, and, and you wish to end it all, yeah. and you suddenly run across the window as if you're going to throw yourself out. But just before you get there, I bring you crashing to the floor! Ah! In a flying rugby tackle. What are you talking Isn't about? It's obvious. I pretend to save your life. She'll like that. Girls go for that sort of thing. I've often found with temps they go for the dramatic. I think you're off your rocker. Does that mean you won't help? Yeah, that is exactly what it means. Flying rugby tackles, indeed. I want no part of it. Suit yourself. I'll get the post boy. It'll be even more impressive if there's a child involved. Postroom, here I come. Mr. Bristow, I just saw Mr. Perkins leaving your office. That means you're getting a temp, doesn't it? Occupational hazard, Miss Hudson. Oh, does Mr. Jones know? <sighs> I'm afraid so. How is he taking it? Um, hopping up and down the whole gamut of human emotions, like a tightrope walker with a pebble in his shoe. Oh, I'm surprised till his temps keep supplying us with girls after the way he treated the last one. Mm-hmm. The clockwork mouse, the dangly spider and the firecrackers, never mind the electric handshake, are the signs of a warped mind. <sighs> he should be locked up. Uh, yeah. I wish... And this is none of my business, mm. but I wish you'd have a word with him, mm. man to man... About the way he treats the temps. Have a word with him? Yes. You're a man, and he respects you. Did he say that? No. No, he didn't say it, but I should imagine he does. Ah, yes. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) Yes. Come in. I said, come in. Excuse me, is this the buying department? Gosh. (laughs) Don't tell me I've died and gone to heaven and you are an angel at the pearly gates. What's your name? Silvana. Attilie's temp sent me. 
Did you say uh, this was the buying department? Yeah. Mr Perkins said second floor, but not exactly where on the second floor. No, no this is it. Uh, sit down, sit down. Thank uh, you. D- did you say Silvana? Yes. Oh, I, <laughs> I like Silvana. <laughs> <laughs> Silvana. <laughs> say it loud and there's music playing. <laughs> <laughs> say it soft and it's almost like praying. What the <laughs> devil is going on out here? Did I hear singing? Uh, this young lady is from Tilly's Temps. Oh. Uh, good morning, Miss... Uh... Hunter. Sylvana Hunter. Is there anywhere I can freshen up? Down the corridor, second door on the left. Uh, thank you, sir. Ooh, allow me. <laughs> second door. Uh, thank you, sir. Get on with your work, you uh, I'm afraid Mr. Brister's not here at the moment. Yes, tell him there's a package on reception waiting to be picked up. Certainly. Morning. Young man, what's your name? Hewitt. Mr. Hewitt, I'm um, Perkins of Personnel. I sent a young lady up ah. here a few minutes ago. Silvana. Silvana Hunter. Yes, she's here. She's gone to freshen up. Ah. And Mr. Brister? He'll be back in a minute. Uh, could you remind him not to forget our conversation earlier, as a favour to me? I'll tell him, sir. Uh, thank you kindly, Mr. Hewitt. Sam Perkins never forgets a kindness. Hello? What was that? A wake-up call for Mr. Bristow? He has one every morning at 10.15? Um, thank you. Ah, Mr. Bristow, yes. uh, you've just missed Mr. Perkins. He said not to forget what he told you this morning. Thank you. And also there's a package for you down in reception. Splendid, splendid. Let battle commence. <sighs> right, Hello. A wake-up call for Mr. Br- you rang a few minutes ago. Oh, I see, you're the backup call. Every morning at 10.20, yep. Thank you. Come in. Ah, good morning again, Silvana. Good morning. Um, there's no need to knock on the door every time you come in. I mean, you're one of us now. Thank you. Do it. I think we'll give Miss Hunter a desk by the window. Uh, we don't have a desk, Mr. Fun. I've made arrangements for one to be sent up. Thank you, sir. Let me know when it arrives, you it. Fudge. Uh, good morning, Mr. Perkins. Yes, Miss Hunter is here. You'd like to see her? Uh, certainly, I'll send her along. Uh, Miss Hunter, you heard that. Uh, Mr. Perkins would like to see you in personnel. You know where it is? Yes. Oh, allow me. Thank you, we'll sir. have your desk in place by the time you are back. Thank you, sir. Get on with your work, Hewitt! Oh, it's not another wake-up call, is it? Sorry? Some flowers in reception for Mr. Jones. It's hard to tell him. The prodigal son checks it. Mr. Bristow, she is here. She is beautiful. She is the most ravishing creature you have ever seen. Rawr. Fantastic. Sylvana. <laughs> I once met a girl named Sylvana. Stop it once, Hewitt. Waxing lyrical on Chester Perry premises is not allowed during working hours. <laughs> You've... Seen her? Yep, I've seen her. And Mr. Fudge has seen her. And even he flipped. He held the door open for her twice. How can these things be? I was only out of the room for five minutes. Held the door open. (laughs) Did he open it wide? Yep. Twice? (laughs) Twice. Wide. Both times. (laughs) Holy mackerel! And he's having a desk sent up. She's to sit next to the window. She'll be next to me. <laughs> I'll be back in a minute. I needed time to think. Things were progressing a little too fast for comfort. And as Zane Grey would have put it, the local citizens were all lining up with a stranger in town. It seemed to me I would have to take the initiative. Having failed to catch sight of her so far, but knowing she was to be given a desk by the window, I was wondering how best to bring in the clockwork mouse when I felt a tugging at my sleeve. Mr. Bristow, uh, uh, wake up! Uh, uh, what? Uh, oh, wake uh, up! Oh, uh, 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 boy. <laughs> Good morning. Never seen you actually asleep on your feet before. Uh, uh, what on earth is the matter with Mr. Jones? Mm. He just asked me to stand on the window ledge and threaten to commit suicide and let him talk me down. Yes, I take no notice. 
It's just his way of trying to impress the new temps when they arrive. Uh, yeah, I'm talking of temps. I need your help. Uh-huh. I wasn't dreaming just now. I was wondering how I can get rid of one who started in the buying department this morning. Uh-huh. She's supposed to be pretty. Uh-huh. And we don't want pretty girls here. They interfere with the workflow. Oh, uh, pretty girls are a distraction. The last thing you need in a firm this size is distraction. Men not pulling their weight. In a firm as big as your uncle's, you want everyone to work as a team. A trim ankle and a well-turned calf sends output figures spiraling down. A come-hither glance can wreak havoc with sales figures at home and abroad. Even a child as young as yourself, if they heard no disrespect meant, can't fail to notice the heads turn when a girl like her walks down the corridor. Heads that are better bent over a ledger or an imminent deadline. She is costing the firm thousands every minute she's on the premises. You're right. Right, Mr. Bristow. She'll have to go. Mm. I'm with you. How do you suggest we go about it? We frighten her away oh. with the contents of this package. Oh, what's in there? Whoopee cushion, electric handshake, dangling spider, a few firecrackers. That should do it. Yeah. Now, let me have the whoopee cushion. No, no, no. no. The electric handshake. <laughs> It's the buying department. That's right. We thought you was on the third floor. No, we've been on the second ever since I've been here. Nobody thought to tell me. We're always the last to know. Got a desk here. Oh. Maybe it is. The goods lift's out of order. We've had to lug it all the way up from the basement to the third. And now back down here. Uh, it goes over by the window. Over by the window, lads. Right, we'll be we finished with it eventually when right. people have made up their minds. How's that? Well, it looks fine. Oh, and uh, here comes the young lady who will be using it. Um, Savannah, what, what do you think? Thank you very much, sir. No problem, miss. We can... Push it around if you like, yeah, if you no. prefer. Yes, Give you a yes. better view. Thank you. That that's lovely. Pleasure, Miss. Come on, lad. <laughs> Everyone here is so kind. Oh. <laughs> well, whose desk is this? Oh, that's mine. Um, oh. <laughs> you don't mind sitting next to me? Well, of course not. <laughs> uh, Miss Hunter, I have a couple of letters before lunch. Uh, yes, sir. Duty calls. Bye. Ciao. <laughs> Buying department. Alarm call for Mr. Bristow. He has one before lunch every day. Yes, thank you. <laughs> A new desk, eh? Yes. She certainly believes in getting her own way, this... Uh, <laughs> What's her name? Silvana? Hunter. <laughs> Hunter. And I'm the hunted. <laughs> Oh. Buying department, here is speaking. I'm wanted in the post room. Yeah, all right, I'll come down straight away. I'm wanted in the post room. As Zane Grey would put it, he opened a drawer in the desk and took from it his well worn gun belt. <laughs> I took lunch on a bench in the park, secure in the knowledge that having planted the items from Joe's joke emporium in and around her desk before she returned from Fudge's office, it was all over by the shouting. There is no way a temp can live in the same room as a dangling spider or a clockwork mouse, and with the postboy as an accomplice, it was simply a question of time. I was in great shape then when I re-entered the office to find a disconsolate Hewitt slumped over his desk. Afternoon, Hewitt. Afternoon. Uh, cheer up, lad. Hello. Where's the temp? How should I know? She was having lunch in the canteen with Perkins of Personnel and that Yobbo Elvis of Production Control when I went in. Oh, she'd only been here a couple of hours and she's dining with the gentry. I uh, calm yourself. You're beginning to smoulder like Jones while he's waiting for the tea trolley. I'm not speaking. 
Knowing of the emotional torment he was undergoing at the hands of the green-eyed monster, I had suffered myself as a child when, having a crush on Sheila Micklethwaite at St Mary's Mixed Infants, I found another boy carrying her toys to school. I murmured some soothing words and moved to the window. To my annoyance, when checking on the booby traps I had set for the temp, I discovered that they had been removed before she could stumble across them. An inkling as to who had done this came when Miss Sunman brought some work in. I'm disappointed in you, Mr. Bristow. Oh, why is that, Miss Sunman? When I asked you to have a word with Mr. Jones about the new temp, I realised it was none of my business to ask you to intercede on her behalf. I know how busy you are to bother with such things, but in my heart of hearts, I hoped you might find the time because she is such a pretty girl and so helpless. And I wouldn't know. I've never seen her. She's never at her desk. I'm not surprised. The thing's going on all around her. Even Mr. Fudge left some flowers for her. <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. I'm not being ridiculous. Mr. Fudge went over there while Sylvana was out of the room and left some flowers on her desk. Uh, you've got it all wrong. The flowers came from Jones. He always buys flowers for the new temps. Uh, Mr. Jones left a whoopee cushion on her seat, a firecracker under her chair, and I found a dangling spider hanging from the window and a mouse thing under the cabinet. Ah, that wasn't Jones. That was uh, someone else. Someone else? Uh, Hewitt. <gasps> he always does those kind of things. That's the child in him. He's like a cat that kills a mouse and leaves it on the doorstep as a present for its owner. Could you have a word with him as well, Mr. Bristow? I'll see what I can do. Thank you, Mr. Bristow. And also one with that nasty postboy. Mm. He had one of those awful buzzing handshakes. Um, the arrival of the tea trolley and Mrs. Purdy was, I suppose, like the arrival of the stagecoach in town and signalled the dramatic events that were to follow. Hello. Uh, a cup of your finest, Mrs. Buddy. Stand clear. Stand clear. Holy mackerel. When I get tea, everyone in the room gets tea. Not to say, though, you're all on your lonesome. Where is everyone? The voice is sending in voice first. Hello, Mr. Jones. Smelt the teapot, did you? Oh, where is this temp that everyone is talking about? He means Sylvana. Here you are, Mr. Oh, Jones. Lovely. Thank you. Isn't she a lovely girl, Mr. Bristol? Oh, I don't know. I haven't seen her either. Oh, Mrs. Purdy, I don't know whether I'm extra thirsty with all my running about, but this tea is delicious. It has a delightful old-fashioned taste to it. The taste of my mother's tea. Do you know what that is, Mr. Ah. Jones? It has an ingredient I had forgotten to include over the past few years. No. And your modern society, with its tea bags and vending machines, has also forgotten. Ah. It was not until my Sylvana made... Mentioned it that the memories came flooding back. Yes. For the ingredient to which you refer is heart. Uh. Tea with heart. There's nothing to beat it, Mr. Jones. Good old heart. You said oh. your Sylvana. Are you referring to our Tim? That's her. Your Sylvana? She's not a relative, surely. Oh, as good as. I've known her parents, the Hunter family, for years. Mr. Purdy and myself met them on the caravan site at Stony Beach on Sea when Sylvana was a baby. Uh, she grew up with my boys, Red and Elvis. So that's how she knows Elvis, the assistant head of production control, with whom she was lunching in the canteen today. It all comes together. Did you say Stony Beach on Sea? Wonderful place. The site goes right down to the water's edge when the tide's in. I know it very well, Mrs. Purdy. It was at Stony Beach on Sea, and this girl, Tondalea, I called her. <sighs> the first girl that ever befriended me had a caravan. Oh. On our first date, we went to a cinema in town. Oh. It was an Italian film called Death in Venice, and starred a beautiful actress called Silvana Magnano. Oh. And afterwards, we lay in each other's arms with the waves crashing against the side of the caravan. Stony Beach on Sea, oh. a caravan, a film star called Sylvana. What are you saying, Jones? Holy mackerel. You don't think it's not possible? Jones, don't say it. I hear footsteps coming down the corridor. Sylvana is returning from lunch. I, I can't face her. Stand back, everyone. Leave this to me. Here it is. Here it is. She married Perkins of Personnel this afternoon in the registry office in town. Elvis of Production Control was best man. Oh, oh, she... 
Ah! Oh. Silvana never returned, but rode off into the sunset as a married woman. There was no showdown, therefore no final reel. I therefore claim the victory. Another notch. I am still undefeated, still the greatest. <laughs> Bristow was written by Frank Dickens and featured Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Bewes as Jones, Dora Bryan as Mrs. Purdy, Owen Brenman as Hewitt, John Glover as Fudge, Katie Odie as Miss Sunman, Simon Schatzberger as the Postboy, David Batley as Stokes, and Jackie Neglia as Silvana, with Leslie Phillips as Mr. Perkins. The music was composed and performed by John Whitehall. The sound recording was by Graham Harper, the director, Neil Cargill. Bristow by Frank Dickens with Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Bewes as Jones, Owen Brenman as Hewitt, and Dora Bryan as Mrs. Purdy. Chapter and Verse As C.P. Scott once said, a newspaper's primary office is the gathering of news. At the peril of its soul, it must see that the supply is not tainted. Would that the same standards applied to a firm's house journal, and in particular that of the Chester Perry organization. Whilst admiring the diligence and hard work involved in the production of same, one may raise an eyebrow at the finished article, as I did when I set eyes on this year's bumper summer number. To give the background story, I must begin with a conversation between myself and the postboy in the buying department of the aforementioned company. <laughs> Mm. Uh, there you go. I, uh, oh, um, thank you. Were you here at the time of the great tea trolley disaster of 67? Shh, keep your voice mm. down, boy. boy. Walls have ears. Yeah. And when speaking of the event, speak softly, as one would in an undertaker's parlour. No, I was not here. It took place before I joined the company. Well, what happened? Shh, shh, shh. Ears. Would anyone in the building today know what happened? I fear not. So many people vanished. Some say fled abroad to the continent or South America. Mm -hmm. We shall never know the exact figures. And there is talk of an unmarked grave in Highgate Woods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that is pure speculation. Well, there must be records. Alas, all records were destroyed in the mysterious Great Fire of 68 when the east wing of the Chester Perry Library burned down. There is talk of a connection between the two events. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again, pure speculation. What about the great luncheon voucher swindle? Child, child, child. If you've been born during the war, we've been none of us left at all. I only said I about heard the... what you said, but I'd be blithe if you keep your voice down when you are inquiring about events that shape the firm. I'm afraid that the great luncheon voucher swindle too was before my time. But there was talk that Sir Reginald's son, your uncle Errol, the playboy, was involved. A pure speculation, naturally. Uncle Errol died, taking his secret to the grave. Uh, How much money was involved? A oh, great deal, running into many thousands of pounds, but still not sufficient to cover the gambling debts incurred in many years of wild spending. And the records? Uh, alack, alas. The fire? A towering inferno. 
As it was a black period in the firm's history. Why doesn't someone do something about keeping a new set of records? Nobody has the time. And we are looking to the future, not back into the past. You have the time. Me? Why don't I forget that idea? You don't seem to do much work. <laughs> uh, you've been taken in, as indeed most people are, by my effortless style of working. On the surface, I appear calm and unruffled, gliding like a swan on the river of commerce. <laughs> but under the water, there is a lot going on. Well, I think you're the right person for the job. Oh, let us stop this foolish talk. And say no more about it. You'll be hearing from us, Mr. Bristow. Cheers! It always surprises me, in an organisation as big as Chester Perry's, how quickly word gets around. I had no sooner taken my seat the next morning when Hickford, of Goods Inward, struggled through the door carrying a bundle of magazines. Here it is, Bristow. Mm -hmm. Bumper summer number of the Chester Perry House Journal. Oh, 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 great. I'm having fish and chips tonight. And fish and chips always taste better eaten out of a house journal. Mm. <laughs> Bristow, mm. I was talking with the postboy yesterday, and he mentioned you were interested in keeping some kind of unofficial record of things that go on within the walls of this building. Mm. Things like the great tea trolley disaster, <laughs> and any other scandals that reach your ears. Oh, I'm afraid the postboy is leading you up the garden He path mentioned that that you maintained your family archives, mm -hmm. which were concerned with military matters. Ah, that is true, Hickford. My family fought all over the world, and in every theatre of war they played mm -hmm. their part. Their bleached bones, their silent tribute. Bleached bones suggest, dare I say it, skeletons in the cupboard? Ah, we have those, of course, like most families. Except that ours are written up. Actions that brought shame and ignominy to the Bristows are all there, Hickford. Mm. Warts and all. <laughs> I refer you to Cousin George Bristow of the Royal Engineers, whose temporary bridge across the Bosphorus collapsed, mm. sending 20 of their best men to a watery grave, Ooh. and who died at the hands of a hastily recruited firing squad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, old Yalla Bristol the black sheep of the family, whose act of treachery led him to end up tied to a cannon in Quebec. Bristow, what mm. you have just told me shows that you are the ideal person to keep an unofficial set of records. Oh, yes. and, and I have a suggestion to put forward for your consideration. Yeah, yeah. I don't know whether you are aware of this, but mm. the House Journal is always looking for items that would be of interest to its readers, and the project you are contemplating is exactly the sort of stuff we have in mind. <laughs> what the devil is going on out here? <laughs> Ah, Mr. Hickford, I didn't see you there. Good morning, Mr. Fudge. Mm. May I present you with your copy of the journal? Oh, yes. I, I was discussing with Mr. Bristow here the possibility of his doing a series of articles for future publication. Bristow? <laughs> well, I, I suppose you know your business, but uh, he does have his work to do. Oh, I don't think they will affect his work, will they, Mr. Bristow? Yeah, well, not very much, but they are bound to affect it a little. It's the time factor. Yeah, yeah, but perhaps I'd better not do the mistake, but I don't want Mr. Fudge to feel... Oh, dear. <laughs> Get on with them. Finish them as quickly as you can. He's probably a little put out. Yeah. He's always sending his poems in with forever returning them. Mm -hmm. Our readers don't seem to care for poetry. Mr. Fudge writes poetry. It's funny that. You can never tell the type of person that writes poetry. All sorts of people take it up. You astonish me. Fudge writes poetry. What kind of poetry? Countryside, floppy rabbits, hip-hip-hopping uh, summer lawns, wide-eyed moths ogling a big round moon. You're kidding. It's quite good, really, but not for our readers. They prefer blood and guts. That's why your scandalous stuff will knock them dead, even if you follow. Oh, I do indeed. Indeed I do. Uh, morning. <laughs> morning, Mr. Jones. May I present you with your copy of the bumper summer number of the House Journal? You never give up, do you? You must have a hide like a rhinoceros. And in spite of all the things they say, you still keep producing it. <laughs> What's this picture on the front supposed to be? 
It's a picture of the assembly line at our northern branch. Is it really? <laughs> it looks like it's done with a potato. You know what I mean? You cut a potato and dip it in paint. We used to do it at school. Oh, no, I'm sorry you feel that way about it. It was done by an amateur. No. But I can see that. Assembly line, is it? <laughs> Staffed by Teletubbies, is it? <laughs> Ignore him, Hickford. Let me see that. <laughs> Teletubbies. <laughs> Very good, Jones. <laughs> you won't be laughing at the next issue, Mr Jones. Mr Bristow is doing a series for us. A series? What about? I'm not at liberty to say at this moment in time. I know. It's about Bristow's family. Old hat, that military stuff. Bang, bang, you're dead. <laughs> boring, boring. There are people who care about their nation's history, Jones. Thinking people, cultured people, not thick yobbos like the sort of people you... Yeah. Yeah. Now, the gentlemen, please, calm yourselves. Now, I must go, I'm afraid. There are people anxiously waiting for their bumper summer number. In your dreams. Thank you, Mr. Bristow. We'll be in touch. I... Bristow, I don't know how you can do it. Buttering up to Hickford so you can get yourself into the House Journal. You don't read it, so it shouldn't bother you. I do read it. In fact, it might surprise you to know that I occasionally submit stuff. Oh, be ridiculous. Oh, you writing in your dreams? You couldn't write to save your life. It might interest you to know that I sent in some poems a couple of weeks ago. You write poetry? You see, I knew you'd be surprised. You're not the only one with literary pretensions. What kind of poetry do you write? Never you mind. Jones, I am interested. I might have seen some of your scribbles. No, you wouldn't. Hickford doesn't like poetry. He's a Philistine. But he has a magazine, and everybody likes to see their work in print. I write nature poems. Sloppy bunnies, hip, 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 hopping on summer's lawns. Wide-eyed moths, ogling a big round moon. That's right. I say, that's quite good. Yeah. Floppy bunnies, wide-eyed moths. Did you just make that up? Uh, yes. But where was I? I'm quite impressed with that. I had no idea. I may put a few lines of poetry in my new series. Something simple. Let's see. Roses of red, violets of blue. Hmm? I must confess I have no liking for poetry. Agreeing with Charles Dickens in the person of Sam Weller, in that it is unnatural, and in particular I have no time whatsoever for poems on nature. What little enthusiasm I have is reserved for such stirring titles as How Horatius Kept the Bridge, or The Siege at Lucknow, and other epics connected with the military. It is, to my mind, extraordinary that two opposites such as Jones and Fudge should, unbeknownst to each other, share a love of poetry, and in particular, poems of nature. And I mentioned this to Mrs. Purdy, the tea lady, when she entered that afternoon. Tea up! Come and get it! Yeah, my usual, please. Uh, Darjeeling with the uh, slice of lemon. Oh, stand back! Oh, oh, oh in mackerel, Mrs. Purdy. Even I, as a hardened and shameless tea drinker, pale to the very gills when I see the flood that threatens to engulf us all at the turn of your tap. <laughs> oh, go on, get that down, you, yeah. and tell me what's new in the buying department. Yeah, 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 Mrs. Purdy, did you know that both Mr. Jones and Mr. Fudge write poetry? Well, I know Mr. Fudge does. Mm. I'm not surprised about Mr. Jones. The strangest mm. people like rhyming things. Mm. My husband likes rhyming things. Mm. He says it's to relieve his inhibitions. Yet to look at him, you'd think butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. Daft he is. Mm. He likes military poems like The Charge of the Light Brigade by mm. Alfred Lord Tennyson. <laughs> half a league, half a league, half a league onward. All in the valley of death rode the six hand. Mm. Do you know that one? Mm, yes, Mrs. Purdy, I do. <laughs> You write yourself. Sometimes I write things about nature. Floppy rabbits hip hip hopping o'er summer lawns. Wide eyed moths ogling a big round moon. Hey, that's one of mine. How did you know yeah, it? Of course, just a little something. 
What do you mean it's one of yours? I wrote it the other day in the laundress in Turnpike Lane. You wrote it? Yes, I did it while I was waiting for the long spin. Mrs. Purdy, did you tell anyone about it? Oh, one or two people. I told Mr. Fudge. That's how I know he writes poetry. You told Mr. Fudge? Yes, he thought it was good. He told me so. Mrs. Purdy, another cup of tea. My head is spinning like the dryer of the washing machine in the laundrette in Turnpike Lane. Yeah, well, wait. Don't pour yet. Let me take colour. I think so. Too late. It seemed to me incredible that a man who held the office of chief buyer in an organisation as big as the Chester Perry Company should resort to filching poems from a tea lady. It was a scoop for my first article for the House Journal. But there were complications, the first of which was that, with Fudge knowing I was doing a series for the aforementioned, he would realise I was behind it, and that would be fatal. After all, I got to eat, don't I? Having no knowledge of what it takes to be a poet, I had no idea of how they think. How strong was their desire to dash off a rhyming couplet? Would they risk life and limb for the right word to complete an ode? How far would they go to get le mot juste? I needed to know before I made a start on my expose, and I took my first steps to the unravelling of the poet's mind that afternoon. Oh, Lily! Oh, Lily! Oh, Lily! Here I... I... Oh, dear. Thank you, young man. You're out of condition, Mr. Bristow. Uh, nonsense. I've been tearing up a few telephone directories to work up an appetite for lunch. Well? Well, what? You want to go somewhere, you say a number. Which floor do you want? I don't want to go anywhere. I need information. Cost you. Cost me? Information don't come free, nor cheap. You should know that, Mr Bristow. <laughs> How much? Depends on what you want information about. Is it investment? Is it home or abroad? It's not Is to it... do with business matters. It's about that kid who's always in trouble for scribbling graffiti all over the place. Rude rhymes, obscene poems. Used to call himself the Phantom Scribbler. Oh, you mean Little Red Purdy, the tea lady's son? Eh, possibly. I wouldn't know. But if you say so... He did the one about the little duck. Yes, that's the boy. I want to find him. What's the time? 11.30. He'll be in the broom cupboard at the end of the corridor on the top floor. What will he be doing there? Hiding out. He was going to scribble something on the boardroom table at 11.15. Then you get to the cupboard, tap three times soft and once loud. Good job. Mr. Bristow, open the door, Red. What do you want? I want to talk to you. Is it about the boardroom table? No, it's about poetry. Oh. Just a minute. Come in quick, Mr. Bristow, before anyone sees you. Now, good afternoon, Red. You were a fool to come, Mr. Bristow. Mm? They may do a cupboard-to-cupboard -cupboard search when they read what the Phantom Scribbler has written on the table. <clears throat> what have you written? He's written a poem about Sir Reginald Chester Perry and one of the typists. Why? Something going on between them? I don't know. Probably. He's a man, she's a woman. You mean you made something up? Yeah. A scandal. That's not very nice. It's not meant to be nice. It's meant to get tongues wagging. That's what the Phantom Scribbler does. He sets the cat among the pigeons. You talk about the Phantom Scribbler as if he was someone other than yourself. He is. He's the dark side of me. The dark side? The part of me I can't control. I hear a rhyme and I'm powerless to help myself. I'm inextricably drawn into the thing that is 
the phantom scribbler. Mm. I'm powerless against it, Mr. Bristow. I've got to write it down. You are saying you will hear a rhyme, and you must write it down? That's right. The rhyme triggers off a compulsion, and the creature inside me will not set me free until I make it mine. Mm -hmm. Would you steal someone else's rhyme? No. Ah, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. But he would. Mm. The dark, inner person within me. Yeah, he was... Holy mackerel! Does that mean there's a dark side to fudge? An even deeper and darker side than the deep and dark side we already know? I don't know what you're talking about. No, it doesn't matter. I'm off. You haven't seen me? I had a feeling I was on strange territory. Good Lord. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Bristow. Uh, what are you doing around here? Oh, uh, Hewitt, you made me jump. I might ask you the same question. And considering I have the advantage of both height and weight, I think you must answer first. Oh, I often come up here to the director's floor to get the feel of the place. I don't want to be caught napping when the call comes. Um... Did you just come out of that broom cupboard? Uh, cupboard? Uh, ah, yes. <laughs> I was returning a broom to the cupboard. Was um, Little Red in there? Uh, there was someone in there. Uh, Whether it was Little Red, I wouldn't know. Oh, come off it, Mr. Bristow. It must have been Little Red. That means he's done the job. <laughs> he's a lad, isn't he? I wouldn't know. I don't know whether it's him or the inner man that's a bit of a lad. At my desk, I tried to marshal my thoughts. If, as Little Red told me, the poet has an inner man, a compulsion to use other people's rhymes, he cannot be held responsible, since this other self is all-powerful. This means that Fudge is not to blame for lifting Mrs. Purdy's flip-floppy rabbits and needs only to see a psychiatrist to sort out his problems. I was trying to put this into some semblance of order for the article when the door opened. You, Mr. Bristow. Ah. Uh, oh. I've been looking all over for you. What can I do for you, Miss Sun? I just wanted to congratulate you. Mm? Mr. Hickford says you're going to do a series of articles for the House Journal. That's right. Will you let me type them for you? Oh, I don't know, Miss Sunman. You were already typing out my novel, Living Death in the Buying Department, an expose of big business. That's right. Mm. I do it Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. When do you type Babes in the Office, my introduction to the white-collar world? Tuesdays and Thursdays. So you only get the weekends free? <laughs> Not really. That's when I do a little writing of my own. You write? I had no idea. Only poetry. Silly, really. I write nature poems. Uh, don't tell me. Floppy rabbits, hip hip hopping, or summer lawn stuff. Who told you? Practically everyone I've spoken to today. That's wonderful. Wide eyed moths ogling the big round moon. Mm. Squirrels uh, topsy turvying from bow to bow. Holy mackerel! Squirrels topsy. You did write it. Did you tell anyone? I told Mrs. Purdy. So Mrs. Purdy has an inner man too. Miss Sunman told Mrs. Purdy, Mrs. Purdy told Fudge, and Fudge sends it up to the House Journal, claiming it to be his. What a story this is going to make. Came the day I handed over the first of my articles to a delighted Hickford. Well done, Bristow. Crack. I'm thrilled. I can't wait to read it. Yeah, thank you. I hope you won't mind me saying this, Hickford, but during the writing, I discovered that you are completely wrong about your readership. Mm -hmm. What way? Oh, everyone I've spoken to during my research is involved in writing nature poems, and your claim that no one is interested in poetry is completely erroneous. Oh, I don't see. Shh. We writers know our public. How else could we bear our souls so freely? A 
few weeks later, I arrived at the building to find a babble of noise and discovered the cause of the excitement was that the first copies of the bumper summer number of the House Journal were out. Well, Bill Vincent, I knew it was good stuff when I heard Bristow mention it. I didn't realise how good it was, though, till I saw it in print. A hit, I'd say, a very palpable hit. Forcing my way through chattering lines of people, I found myself at the front. You'll have to queue like everyone else. As a contributor, I do not see why I should have to. Here you are, then. Owing to unprecedented demand, only one copy per person. Thank you. It was an excellent front cover. Quote. The Chester Perry House Journal Management are pleased to announce that starting today, a new and brilliant feature by a new and brilliant contributor, which will appear regularly within these covers, can be found on page 13. Splendid. Page 13. 10. 11. 12. Here we are. We proudly present the first of a series of nature poems by Sir Reginald Chester Perry, our beloved firm's founder. Floppy rabbits, hip hip hopping, or summer lawns. <laughs> Bristow was written by Frank Dickens and featured Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Bewes as Jones, Owen Brenman as Hewitt, Dora Bryan as Mrs. Purdy, Katie Odie as Miss Sunman, John Glover as Fudge, Simon Schatzberger as the Postboy and Red, and Ian Kelland as the Lift Boy, with Roger Lloyd Pack as Hickford. Music was composed and performed by John Whitehall. Sound recording was by Graham Harper, the director, Neil Cargill. Bristow by Frank Dickens. With Michael Williams as Bristow. Rodney Views as Jones, Dora Bryan as Mrs. Purdy, Owen Brenman as Hewitt, and featuring Liz Fraser and Joan Sims as Gert and Daisy. Repaying Mr. Piper. Every time I set eyes on the lazy, cretinous, good-for-nothing, pathetic creature that answers to the name of Jones, I find myself curious as to the mentality of the person who, upon meeting Jones at the inevitable first interview, decides here is a fellow with a future in a white-collar environment. <laughs> what manner of man would even consider making an offer of employment to someone like Jones, so out of place in civilized surroundings? And anyway, what kind of supercilious being is it? sets himself up as both judge and jury to decide whether John or George or Jack is the right man for the job on offer. <sighs> I remember the interview for my first job as if it were yesterday. And that, I suppose, brings me to this job, marked with an asterisk, that is the nearest after this one on page three, which I explained a few moments ago, to the job for which I am applying. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes. Why are you showing it to me? Because I only work on reception and I don't know what you're talking about. I think you need recruitment. That's it. Recruitment. That's why I came to you. 
I can see how the mistake occurred. Both words, reception and recruitment, start with the letters R, D, C before they go their respective ways. Reception, recruitment. <laughs> Most confusing. You ought to mention this to someone in authority. Third floor, room 417. Mr. Piper. Ah, hmm. Good morning, Miss Piper. <laughs> and may I start by saying, how cunning of you to be sitting with your back to the window, so that whilst you can see me clearly, with the light playing on my frank and open features, I can see no expression whatsoever on your face, and therefore will have no idea of how the interview is progressing. You are to use an old RAF Battle of Britain fighter pilot term, coming in out of the sun. You fought in the Battle of Britain? Uh, no. But for me, it is required reading. And I have a great deal of literature on the subject. I see. And you are applying for a job with F&D Educational Toys? That is the object of my visit. And, may I say, if the reception I have been so far accorded is anything to go by, I will fit in here like a pea in the proverbial pod. You think so? I know so. That is, unless my handwriting lets me down. <laughs> you see... It cannot keep up with the performing flea that is my mind. It lacks the speed, you understand. <laughs> I do understand only too well. <laughs> and the reason why we can't offer you employment is because I don't think you'll fit in with the present staff at F&D Educational Toys. You are turning me down? That's right. May I ask the reason? I've already given it. You won't fit in with our present staff. On a scale of one to ten, how would I not fit in with your requirements? I don't understand the question. I'm not particularly interested. The door is over your left shoulder. You don't want me? No. Is that your final answer? Yes. You won't change your mind? No. Final answer? Be gone, Mr Bristow. Be gone. Be gone. Be gone. Be gone. As I came out of the building, I realised I had been tried and sentenced by this one man's judgement. The idea that a stranger can alter the course of a life by a sudden decision makes no sense in a civilised society. For had that man been in a different mood, I might have been in the educational toy business from then until this very day. The question I asked myself as I made my way sadly up the street is what went wrong. Was it Piper's fault or my own? I was not to know the answer until many years later, when, as I left the Chester Perry building, where I work as a buying clerk, I was accosted by an evil-looking man, unshaven and wild of eye. <laughs> yeah. oh. Afternoon, sir. Any change to spare? Change? Enough for a couple. You see, I come out without any money, left it on the bedside table. Uh. No, I can't get home. I need the fare, like. Oh... Thank you, sir. Is that all? Yeah. Not much, is it? Still, I suppose it'll get me started. You, you work for the Chester Perry Company, don't you? Huh? Uh, I've seen you go in and I've seen you come out, so you can't deny it. And Looking at your cheerful and open face, I can see you've got a good job there. As a matter of fact, it's a lousy job. Uh, haven't we met before? No, sir. Uh, oh. oh, Piper's the name, Sid Piper. If we'd met, I'd have remembered. I've got a memory for faces. Well, I have a feeling for events. And I have a feeling we've met before. Yes. It's coming back to me. You interviewed me once. F&D Educational Toys. Oh. You turned me down. Uh, F&D Toys, eh? Yeah. Uh, could, could be, could be. I uh, turned down so many. <laughs> yes, I remember you. Yeah. The Battle of Britain chap. You accused me of coming out the sun. You said I wouldn't fit in with the people who worked there. Well, you wouldn't have done. Wouldn't you like to know why? Well, of course. I'd like to tell you that if you got the money for a drink, the snug bar of the Brolly and Bowler is around the next corner. <laughs> Follow me, my dear sir. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> uh, my story is a sad one. Mm -hmm. 
than years ago, the, the time you saw me, I was personnel officer at Evan D. Educational Toys. Mm. I fell passionately in love with the boss's daughter, a graceful creature fresh from finishing school in Switzerland. I asked her father for her hand, the customer at the time, and he had the effrontery to laugh in my face. So? Told me I wasn't good enough. Laughed in my face he did. Not good enough! Not good enough! I work my fingers to the bone for him in his lousy, rotten firm, and he tells me I'm not good enough! Hey! Keep it down! We can't hear ourselves sing! <laughs> Sorry! Sorry! <laughs> well, now they know, where was I? You weren't good enough! Uh, uh, that's right. Uh, not good enough. <laughs> Angry and frustrated, I, I determined to ruin him. With this object in mind, I decided to engage simple and uneducated people, mm. thinking that by filling the place with simple and uneducated morons, the business would go down the drain. That's when you applied for a job. <sighs> when you told me your mind was like a, a performing flea and mentioned handwriting, I put you down as too intelligent to work there. Oh, yeah. oh, oh thank you. <laughs> yeah. Too intelligent, eh? <laughs> Would you like another drink? <coughs> Too kind. Yeah, yeah. And did the business go down the drain? No. Quite the reverse. Mm. The educational toys did their job. The staff all turned out to be above average intelligence. And I got the sack for not being up to standard. Another drink, did you say? Why not? <sighs> That night, I hardly slept through thinking of the conversation. It was obvious that by employing idiots like Jones, the personnel manager at Chester Perry's was adopting the very same tactics used by Piper. But why? Was he involved with Sir Reginald's daughter, the fabulous Fiona? <laughs> I determined to find out. <laughs> Jones, what's the name of the personnel officer here? Oh, forget it, Bristow. What do you mean, forget it? Bristow, don't make an even bigger fool of yourself than you already are. What's that supposed to mean? You forget. This place is like a village. Word gets round in seconds. What word? About what? The accounts department was giving a farewell party last night in the Brolly and Bola, and you were seen having a drink and a serious discussion with a tramp in the snug bar. We don't want that kind applying for a job here. Some of us have stamp. How do you hold a moonbeam in your hand? Do you have Earl Grey this morning? Earl Grey coming up. Oh, holy mackerel. Oh, come down off your chair. A bit of tea won't hurt you. <coughs> Mrs. Purdy. Who is the personnel officer here? Mr. Sheldrake. What's he like? Sheldrake? Ah, oh, weak tea, no sugar. Oh, got him, yes. Middle-aged, very nice, very handsome, likes the ladies. A proper Lothario. Oh. Or should I say, was a proper Lothario. He's getting married soon, someone down there was saying. The kitchen staff concern themselves with what goes on up here, do they? We like to keep our finger on the pulse, so to speak. Our tea bag in the water. <laughs> I just thought of that. Tea bag in the water. Oh, good, isn't it? <laughs> Mm. No, the reason I say he's getting married soon is because one of the girls saw two spoons in his saucer last week. <laughs> two spoons in a saucer means a marriage is on the cards, does it? Of course it does, and the signs are never wrong. You can laugh all you like, but they're never wrong. <laughs> what is going on out here? Uh, Mrs. Purdy! Are you going to be talking to Bristow for much longer? He's wasted enough time today. Oh, I'm just saying, Mr. Fudd. Goodbye, <laughs> Mr. Bristow. Uh, yeah. Get over your work, Bristow! So, our uh, Mr. Sheldrake is a bit of a Lothario, is he? <laughs> Most interesting. And they say history has a habit of repeating itself. Oh. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Bristow, uh, my ears have been burning all day. That means there are millions of people all over the world telling themselves that there's always someone worse off than themselves, mm -hmm. and your name springs automatically to their lips. Yes, yeah, very funny. Ken, Hewitt, when you applied for a job here, mm -hmm. 
Who interviewed you? Uh, Mr. Sheldrake. Was it a good interview? Uh, not really. I had the feeling I'd got the job anyway. Uh, you've got the impression he'd have hired anybody. Uh, well, sort of, yes. Uh. He's a relaxed sort of guy. Look, uh, Mr. Bristow, do you ever ponder on the meaning of life? Yes, frequently. Mostly when I'm doing the filing or invoicing. Uh. Or, in fact, any of the jobs that flesh is there to... Yes, well, I can see you're in a flippant mood. I'm going downstairs where they talk seriously about things. The plot thickens. It seems to me this Sheldrake character is tarred with the same brush as my down-and-out acquaintance of last evening, and by employing people of Jones and Hewitt Silk, is endeavouring to ruin the Chester Perry organisation. <laughs> Speaking personally, I have nothing against this, but why should he wish to do so? Unless, as I mentioned earlier, the daughter of the firm's founder was involved. <laughs> Mm. How dare you send in work like this for me to type out? Let me see that. Get... Holy mackerel! Right in the middle of a business letter. I do apologise most sincerely. I saw some graffiti from the train window this morning and it, it must have stuck in my mind. <laughs> uh, before you go, Miss Hunden. Yes? How old is Sir Reginald Chester Perry's daughter, the fabulous Fiona? Why? Oh, there's no special reason... There must be a reason. You don't suddenly ask a girl's age for nothing. I'm not asking on my own behalf. I'm asking you because, um... Because Mr Jones mentioned it. <laughs> Mr Jones? Mm. <laughs> no chance. She's the same age as I am. Ah, a mere slip of a child, then. Oh, give over. <laughs> and suddenly, Lady Luck who had been lying low for yonks, smiled on me, and it came from an unexpected quarter. Christo, mm. take this up to Mr. Sheldrake's office. Mr. Sheldrake's office? Is there something wrong with your hearing? Mm. I find myself having to continually repeat myself when I am talking to you. Pull yourself together, man. Concentrate. Yes, Mr. Fudge, certainly, Mr. Fudge. <laughs> Concentrate. Don't get on with it, and don't take all day. Mr. Sheldrake's office was on the floor above. It's open. Good afternoon, sir. Mr. Sheldrake? He's not in at the moment. He's gone to have a haircut or something. Can I help? Uh, will you give this to him? It's from Mr. Fudge hmm. of the buying department. Mm. The big, fat, bald-headed chap with a loud voice. That's him. He painted a very good word portrait of the bane of my life. <laughs> it must be hell to work anywhere near him. That voice of his goes right through you. It's worse than that. It travels via account, production, development and costing before it goes right through you. <laughs> What's it like working with Mr. Sheldrick? Ah, he's a pussycat. Is he? <laughs> Have a chocolate. Yeah. A can of you? <laughs> he's always mm. buying me chocolates, mm. and I'm always giving them away. <laughs> Take two. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a guitar on his desk? Yes. He plays it when he's in a good mood. Mm. He's in love at the moment, so we've had love songs all morning. <laughs> oh, dear. Is that the time? Mm? I must get on. I have things to do. <laughs> you have a stool to get the work done, then? Good Lord, no. I have a hairdressing appointment at three. <laughs> The next morning, happening by chance to come across the cleaning ladies, Gert and Daisy, enjoying a well-earned cup of tea, I decided to pursue my investigations. Uh, good morning, ladies. Good morning, good Mr. Morning, Mr. Bristow. Bristow. I wonder whether you can help me. 
I'm interested in knowing something of Sir Reginald Chester Perry's daughter, Fiona. Um, the pair of you clean their stately home. I wondered whether you could tell me something about her. Oh, certainly not. And I'm surprised that you're asking. Surprised that you're asking. But it's just that I wondered whether she was going steady with anyone at the moment. Oh, we wouldn't know. We are not privy to her love life. Our lips are sealed. Mm. She doesn't leave sonnets and love poems all over the bedroom or carve anyone's initials on doors and tables. We don't know anything, and if we did, we couldn't tell anybody. Especially you. Daisy, don't be rude. Mr. Bristow's only asking. Let him ask someone else. We've signed that paper. You see the problem, Mr. Bristow? We've signed the paper. <laughs> I quite understand. Thank you, folks. Of all my ancestors, the one who stands out in my mind is Uncle Gaylord Bristow, who plied his trade on the Mississippi steamboats. He used to brag that he would always back a hunch, and until he met his death at the hands of some unsportsman like cattle barons who threw him over the side, said that his hunches had never let him down. My admiration for him owes much to the fact that I seem to have inherited his intuition. And e'en as I speak, I'm on my way to the postroom to test my hunch. Hello, Mr. Bristow. What can I do for you? Yes, yeah, my boy. Does your cousin, the fabulous Fiona, have a boyfriend? She has loads of boyfriends. Anyone in particular? How about Sheldrake or Clasnell? Sheldrake? Mm. Don't be daft. He wouldn't get anywhere near Fiona. Yeah. Uncle Reg wouldn't allow anyone working here being in the same street as her. Yeah. Sheldrake would lose his job if he even tried. <sighs> My hunch paid off. The swinging playboy Sheldrake turns his roving eye in the direction of Fiona Chester Perry, but realises he would lose his job if he followed up, so he decides to bring the firm down. Thanks, Uncle Gaylord. I needed to talk to Piper, so after work that night, I drifted into the lonely, seedy, tacky back streets by the canal. The only sounds, my footsteps, the howling of a stray cat, and the splashing of water rats. <laughs> getting dark, and the streets were silent, ominous. There was danger here. Hello, Mr. Bristow. <laughs> ah, Stokes, the Chester Perry caretaker. Yet, what are you doing in this neck of the woods? I'll come out for a walk. Well, why choose these mean and sordid streets? I live in the building, don't I? You come out for a walk, you're in mean and sordid streets. <laughs> what you doing here? That's more to the point. I'm looking for a Mr. Piper. You wouldn't know him. Who wouldn't? I know everybody round here. Sid Piper ain't here today. Uh, he works the city in the South Bank on Fridays. Tomorrow's the best day to meet him. <laughs> he goes to the Panda and Bean Shoot, the pub opposite St. Mary's Church in Religion Street. Uh, Be there about three. <laughs> But be careful, Mr. Bristow. Mm. He's a tricky one, that piper. Bad blood. Yeah. Watch out for that stray cat. <laughs> Next day, I made my way to the Panda and Bean Shoot. Arriving there just before three, it was packed. There was no sign of Piper, and I decided to wait outside. I purchased a drink and made my way to the garden. Across the road, crowds of people were arriving at St Mary's Church for a wedding. Hello, how very nice to see you. Hello, Mr Bristow. Good heavens, Miss 
Daisy Birdie. I didn't recognize you without your trolley. What are you doing here? I'm going to the wedding across the road. Didn't I tell you two spoons in the saucer? Two spoons means a wedding. I told you, but you didn't listen. You laughed. Well, I'm laughing last, and you last, last, last longer. You can't claim that. If your old wife's tale is right, spoons found in Mr. Sheldrake's saucer means Mr. Sheldrake himself will be getting married. That's right, he's getting married today. He threw a shindig last night while you were out on the town with Mr. Stone. I wasn't out with him. I just bumped into him on my way to meet someone. Honestly, this firm... You missed a lovely party anyway. Mr. Sheldrake was in a good mood, telling everyone about his good fortune. That's why I invited everyone to the wedding. Oh, look! There's Mr. Jones and Mr. Hughie. I don't believe this. The weekend is here and I'm surrounded by the same old week-long faces. What on earth are you doing here, Bristow? Hmm? You weren't invited. You didn't come to the shindig last night. Great party, Mr. Bristow. I didn't know anything about a party. Nobody mentioned a party. And I was in the office all day. Oh, uh, it, it was an impromptu, a, a sudden decision on Mr. Sheldrake's part. Uh, and we couldn't find you. Yeah, that's right. We couldn't find you. Hello, Mr. Bristow. Well, well, Gert and Gert and Daisy. I didn't recognise you without your bucket and broom. <laughs> Where's the other half? I'm here, Mr. Bristow. Ah. But what are you doing here? You wasn't out. Ooh, what's that for? Sorry. Oh, ignore her, Mr. Bristow. She gets confused at weddings. Uh, Did you get that information you wanted? About Fiona? Uh, uh, yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, are you ladies here for the wedding? We're here to clean up afterwards, really. Don't throw confetti till they're clear of the pool. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bristow. Uh, good afternoon, Miss Sullivan. <laughs> Another man married, another hope dashed. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. Oh, no, no, here comes Mr. Sheldrake. Oh, oh don't no. be no. Well, he should do. After all, he's marrying into money and plenty of it. And at last night's party, he told me he's been offered a partnership in his father-in-law's firm, which means he'll never have to work again. So that's why he was hiring any old body. He couldn't care less what was happening to Chester Perry's. He's marrying Fiona. No, Lorraine! Lorraine? Lorraine. 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 Yes. Lorraine. It's her father owns F&D Educational Toys. F&D Educational Toys? Did you say F&D Educational Toys? She did. F&D. Toys. Educational. F&D. That's what I said, didn't I? Hello. They're going in. Oh, come on, Mr. Bristow. Come into the church and see the happy couple wed. Come on. Protesting feebly, but caught up in circumstances beyond my control, I allowed myself to be led across the road and into the church. As if in a dream, I heard music. My mind was still whirling at the strange turn of events. I had completely misread the scenario. Spellbound at my own stupidity, I came round to hear the priest intoning the words that everyone waits for. If any man here knows any reason why this couple should not be joined together in holy matrimony, let him speak now. I do. Oh, Saint Piper, what the man that wasn't good enough for her. Ask her father, he'll tell you the great tabalard. Take your hands off me. You. I will make my point. It's that friend I will of Bristol's. Bristow was written by Frank Dickens and featured Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Bewes as Jones, Dora Bryan as Mrs. Purdy, Owen Brenman as Hewitt, Liz Fraser as Gert, Joan Sims as Daisy, John Glover as Fudge, Mr. Piper and the Vicar, Katie Odie as Miss Sunman, Simon Schatzberger as the Postboy, David Batley as Stokes, and Jackie Neglia as Miss Pleasant.
music was composed and performed by John Whitehall. Sound recording was by Graham Harper, the director, Neil Cargill. <laughs>